All right, people. Uh, so here is Ali Raza and Thomas Unger talking about Unikernel Linux. So over to you. Uh, can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so um, let's start. Hi, uh, I'm Alirza. I'll be presenting uh, our work on Genicon Linux uh, with Tommy Unger. And uh, as you can see, um, there are a lot of people uh, who are part of this team. Some of them are part of Boston University, others from Red Hat. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll quickly go over the initial parts of this talk, uh, the motivation, what we've done, and uh, I'll try to get to the uh, later parts where we show the results, what we've done, and then Tommy, who likes to live dangerously, will uh, show a demo of the project. Uh, so so uh, the structure of today's uh, general uh, purpose operating systems is not suitable for a number of today's key use cases. And the cloud has uh, taken this problem and uh, brought it to the forefront. Uh, cloud workloads are typically run inside dedicated virtual machines, and the other workloads, which are all run bare metal, are also single purpose uh, workloads. So a general purpose operating system designed to multiplex resources among many users and processes uh, is instead being uh, replicated across many uh, machines, often single user, single process. Um, so you know that's a general purpose operating system uh, running a single application workload. Also, applications that require high-performance I.O. use frameworks like DPDK and SPDK to bypass the kernel and gain unimpeded access to hardware devices. So clearly, for some cases, general-purpose operating systems are, uh, are not the answer. And uh, researchers, uh, people from industry and academia, have been looking at uh, uh, special-purpose operating systems. In response to these questions, there has been a resurgence of research exploring the idea of library operating systems or unikernels. So uh, very quickly, uh, what is a unikernel? In a unikernel, an application is statically linked with a specialized kernel and deployed uh, directly on hardware, where it might be virtual or physical. The application runs in a single address space with the kernel. There is no separation between uh, the privilege levels. Uh, unikernels uh, in research and uh, other projects have shown uh, to be small and lightweight when compared to normal kernels like Linux, and uh, they allow application-specific optimizations. There are uh, many uh, examples of different uh, unikernels, some of uh, them you can see on the screen, which have demonstrated uh, significant advantages in boot time, security, um, resource utilization, IO performance, things like that. So uh, the question is that despite these advantages, why are unikernels not uh, very widely uh, adopted? And one might find the reason for this in, in how the unikernels are developed. For example, some of them are from scratch, where the entire code base is new, or some of them are uh, developed by forking an existing operating system like Linux or NetBSD, and then they are stripped and modified to such a degree that uh, you create a lightweight operating system, um, uh, lightweight uh, unikernel. Uh, in both of these op uh, approaches, the code is essentially new from clean, uh, from the from scratch approach, the clean slate approach, or if you modify the code and add uh, glue code on top of it and add uh, code underneath it to do the orchestration, things like that. So uh, a lot of the code is new, and this brings us to the problem that uh, people who are running uh, uh, workloads in production do not trust uh, new code bases. They want to go to code bases which are well tested, like Linux. And these unikernels uh, uh, mostly run on virtualized environments and do not support accelerators or uh, do not have support for uh, device drivers or different architectures. And also, if you compare it to Linux, where there's a large developer community around uh, around Linux, uh, which uh, keeps updating the project and keeps fixing different bugs, these uh, new operating systems, these new unikernels, uh, do not have that kind of support around them. So that's why they are not uh, really used in production. So the question uh, we asked ourselves is that, uh, can we take a unikernel model and apply it to Linux? Uh, we, we, and I mean, what I mean by that is, can we create a unikernel which can live as a set of if diffs uh, in Linux code? Uh, can we reuse uh, the, the Linux code to, uh, uh, to create this model where uh, whereby we can uh, inherit all the good properties of Linux. Uh, it's it's battle tested code base. It's huge developer community. It's uh, the support for different architectures and devices, and also uh, provide application specific optimizations. So, 
uh, very quickly, what are the goals uh, for this project? We want to run unmodified applications. We want to target upstream acceptance because there is no point in having an out of tree uh, fork which we have to maintain over and over again. The idea is to create, uh, to have as minimal changes as possible so that they can be potentially uh, by uh, discussions with the community and how uh, the community wants to take it forward, we can have uh, some upstream acceptance. And uh, for that, uh, one, as I said, minimal code changes, and two, we need to show some performance benefit um, to start with. And once this is part of the upstream kernel, anyone who wants to uh, deploy unikernels can have their own specific optimizations, which uh, which show which which will give further benefits. Also, we want to have uh, ease of uh, build and use, uh, ease of debugging, ease of profiling, so that uh, you do not feel uh, uh, to be working in a restricted environment when uh, deploying unikernel workloads. And uh, we want to not only uh, target virtual uh, deployments, but also bare metal deployments. So uh, very quickly, jumping to the very end, what is the current status of the project? Uh, right now, we've, uh, we've been working on it for a few years now. And now, finally, we have a fully functional unikernel, which runs unmodified applications. Uh, we feel that the code changes are minimal. Uh, and I'll talk about them uh, in the end as well. Uh, we show some proof, uh, performance improvements uh, for unmodified applications, and we'll have results uh, in the stock. And Tommy will talk about examples of deeper optimizations, which show further benefit. Uh, so uh, just jumping over very quickly what the basic architecture is, how uh, the Unix, Linux unit kernel basically works, and how it's different from normal, unit, normal Linux. Um, on your screen, as you can see, uh, this is how a normal system normally works. Application makes fun make function calls to the to glibc or other such libraries, and such C libraries make then, then make C sys calls into the kernel. Normally, this is what happens. Although applications can make sys calls as well, but let's take the uh, no, uh, the easier case and. Uh, so what happens with uh, in in UKL is that uh, the application glibc all other appli application level libraries whatever uh, is part of the application package gets uh, statically linked uh, with the kernel binary so the final vm linux actually contains everything um, statically linked together the sys calls are replaced by uh, function calls so there are no sys calls uh, in the in the Unica, in UKL uh, what's the memory layout? Uh, normally, what happens that the kernel has space uh, in the higher end of memory, uh, in the address space, and the application binary lives in the lower uh, end of uh, the address space. Then comes the heap, which grows upward. There's a stack, which grows downward. And there's uh, spaces for different VMAs, which can be in the middle. Uh, we follow in UK Linux, we follow almost a very similar uh, memory model, except that because the application uh, is statically linked with the kernel, the application text, uh, uh, data, other sections live with the kernel uh, kernel's binary up top, and everything else is exactly the same. Uh, uh, if we talk about uh, how do we deal with uh, syscall, the kernel entry exit part. So normally, as you can see, when you do a syscall, you come to the syscall entry point, and it's in uh, Linux, this is the entry syscall 64. Uh, after that, you run some entry code. Uh, before running the entry code, you first switch the stack from user stack to kernel stack. Uh, then you run some entry code, which includes RCU and uh, related things. Then you go to the underlying kernel functionality. On the way back, you run exit code, which includes different things like scheduling and signal handling and things like that. And finally, you switch back to user uh, stack and you go back to user space. In, in UKL, uh, because we live in uh, kernel space, there we do not, there's no syscalls. So we actually use uh, function calls, but uh, we make function calls again to the syscall entry point. What this gives us is uh, instead of reinventing the wheel, instead of figuring out how to handle uh, signals, how to do uh, scheduling, uh, how to do where to do the stack switches, we simply reuse all of the code uh, that the Linux that Linux has. This also gives us uh, the benefit that the application uh, gets an environment which it expect application code gets the environment which it expects uh, uh, to get, and the kernel is also dealing with application code which uh, is which is scheduled in and out, which uh, uh, and deals with the RCU at clearly well-defined uh, points. So uh, we reuse a lot of kernel and uh, we reuse the kernel entry and exit code. Uh, I want to go over and talk to talk about the results that we have, uh, but 
very very briefly i want to talk about uh, all the uh, major uh, points that we had to deal with uh, over the years and how different uh, different uh, problems we had to fix. Uh, so first of all, uh, and these are just a, a small subset of them. Uh, first of all, the exec mechanism. Um, it was Tommy actually who, uh, who realized that if we follow the normal exec path of uh, that the Linux kernel follows to uh, execute any application, it 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 help it would help us uh, in basically creating uh, an environment with uh, where everything is properly set up. For example, the task struct is properly set up, the mm struct is properly set up. Only two differences that we do uh, here are, and this this is uh, hidden behind if defs if defs and if conditions that we stay in kernel space. We do not uh, return irit back to. Uh, to user space, we stay in kernel space, and also we follow the ex entire exact path without actually uh, having an elf binary. So we do not run those parts of the code. Otherwise, everything else is properly set up. This also allows glibc to do all the initializations when uh, when glibc uh, code is called because it gets an environment which is properly set up. I'll talk about page faults uh, very quickly. Uh, since we're always in kernel mode, hardware-based stack switch to the kernel stack does not happen. And when faults or interrupts occur, uh, we uh, we do not uh, switch the kernel stack uh, uh, automatically. So when user run outs of uh, when we run out of user stack, the resulting page fault has uh, no stack itself to service that original fault, and we get escalated to a double fault. Um, so there are two mechanisms of dealing with that in UKL, and we uh, you can choose one of them based on uh, through through a config option. So first is to deal with it as a uh, double. So when it gets ex escalated to a double fault, only deal with it uh, then on the double faults uh, dedicated stack, or we can change all page faults to use a, a dedicated stack through the interrupt stack table mechanism. I, I'm happy to talk about these things uh, offline. Uh, so not going into any detail here. Uh, kernel entry exit assembly code changes uh, when you enter or exit the kernel, uh, be it via uh, syscalls or what used to be syscalls, uh, interrupts, faults, whatever. There's assembly code which is uh, which is uh, which bases its logic on the fact that uh, the CS value on stack will be correct uh, and it will tell you if you came from user uh, space or you came from kernel space because we're always in kernel space. That CS value on stack is not is always the kernel uh, CS value. So we uh, have uh, uh, we've uh, made mechanisms of keeping track of which code we came from, the application code or the kernel code, and we uh, we we uh, basically reuse all of that entire code, and we give an environment in where you, uh, any application which is running as a unikernel uh, experiences the same uh, environment as uh, it would uh, running in user space. Only we have uh, performance benefits because of running as a unikernel. And we had to uh, make changes to the linker scripts to add uh, sections like TLS, which are normally not part of the kernel binary, but are part of the application binary. So, um, so these are a few of the changes that uh, and problems that we had to fix. Uh, 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 there's there's plenty of detail there, and uh, if anyone wants to talk about these, um, so I'll just talk, talk about the basic optimizations. Uh, we talked about this uh, diagram earlier. How we use the kernel uh, syscall entry points. Uh, we uh, found that uh, we can do an optimization where, uh, in the entry code, where we switch to kernel stack. If we do not switch to kernel stack, we stay on user stack, and on the way back also, uh, you know, no switch stack, uh, no stack switch. We stay on user stack. We get slight performance benefit, and we'll show the results uh, in a bit. And also, uh, because everything is statically linked together. You do not have to go through the system uh, syscall entry points to get the kernel functionality. You can bypass the kernel entry and exit code uh, and go directly invoke the underlying kernel functionality. Um, so this this has uh, huge performance advantages because uh, this means that whenever going from application code to kernel code, uh, you do not have to do uh, you do, not, you do not have to be scheduled out. So this is kind of a run to completion kind of thing. Uh, there's no RCU or other bookkeeping happening. But uh, this should not be done indefinitely because uh, because the kernel has to do these uh, these bookkeepings and these signal handling and other things at some point. Uh, and we also realized that uh, if you if you uh, bypass a large number of uh, these entry exit code paths, uh, the the returns uh, the increase in uh, performance uh, diminishes. Uh, so there's no point in actually doing it. 
for a large uh, number of uh, entry exit code paths. Um, this also, if you do it for a large number, the tail latency goes up because the kernel then does, whenever it gets the chance, it does all its uh, backlog work at that point. So uh, we, we choose a number between 10 to 20 based on you know uh, what application we need to do a proper analysis of this, that what number is uh, well suited. Uh, so it's, a, it's a basically a per thread uh, functionality all uh, the application developer has to do is just call UKL set bypass uh, and wherever the uh, performance critical code starts uh, and uh, call it again when the code ends or even if you do not want to do that, call it once uh, at the start of your uh, application and uh, automatically uh, n number of maybe it may be 10, 10 uh, entry exit code paths will be bypassed and one of them will go through the normal path. So you do all that work. So you get all these benefits. All of this is uh, totally automatic, automatically done because Linux generates function stubs uh, in this is called defined macros and glibc calls those stubs through its macros. So the, the code changes are extremely minimal. The uh, application developer does not uh, have to do anything there. Uh, also, as you can see here, uh, we do not actually change or take out uh, any of the Linux kernel code. The changes are set of if defs in the Linux kernel code. Uh, last I checked, we have uh, 1,200 lines of insert insertions and 400 deletions. These deletions are not really deletions. This is just basically reorganizing uh, the code in inside different if conditions. So we do not take code out of the Linux kernel, which means all the Linux kernel functionality is still there. So you can actually run a... Um, a full uh, sidecar user space while your unikernel runs in uh, uh, in in kernel space. Uh, we uh, so this this uh, is totally optional. You can use it to SSH into your unikernel and perform uh, and manage the system. We use it to do uh, perf analysis, which will uh, Tommy will get to. And uh, production unikernels do not need to do this. They can be very slim and not have a user space. Uh, Finally, very quickly, uh, in, in order to, we do uh, require applications to be rebuilt with uh, a memory model of kernel because it has to link, get it has to be linked with the kernel uh, code and no red zone because uh, when going from uh, in interrupts and faults, there's no stack switch happening. So the red zone can be trampled on. Uh, so that's why these two flags we need for recompilation and uh, just Compile uh, all the application by libraries and everything together, do a partial link, and then the kernel final linking step will create a final Linux, uh, VM Linux binary. Uh, very quickly, uh, the results, uh, Linux, uh, you'll see Linux there, which takes for a get prepaid call, uh, the latency is 299 nanoseconds. Uh, UKL process is basically the same uh, workload running as a sidecar in user space. Again, 299 nanoseconds. So all of the UKL changes actually do not introduce any uh, regression. Uh, then UKL kernel stack, KS means kernel stack that when you go to kernel code, it switches to kernel stack. Uh, uses the US means it stays on the user stack. So you can see the numbers there. And bypass are exactly the same uh, case as uh, before, only we uh, bypass the entry and exit code. So you can see a huge benefit uh, there as compared to normal Linux. Uh, we ran benchmarks. This is uh, a benchmark which does, uh, which reads a buffer from memory. Um, as you can see, I'll just talk about the blue line, which is Linux, and the red line at the very bottom, which is the highly optimized uh, unikernel case, where you stay on user stack and also bypass n number of uh, entry exit code paths. Uh, as you can see, uh, the smaller uh, graph shows us the, the uh, spread of different uh, uh, measurements that we took to show us the variance in these graphs. So you can see we uh, there's, there's an offset uh, that we do better than normal Linux. Um, right also uh, shows us similar results. Um, um, uh, apologies for quickly going over these. Um, unmap uh, similar results. Um, page fault also. This is where we uh, fault in every page uh, of the buffer. And as we go up, uh, the, in the difference increases because it is accumulation of all the page faults. So for uh, for five uh, for a buffer which consists of five pages, you have to page fault the first four as well. So that's why it uh, stacks up. Um, these are memcached d results, uh, running bare metal, 
uh, run, using all the pthread uh, and lib event libraries that it wants, totally unmodified code. The tail lat latency, as you can see, are at 500,000 QPS, you see 11% improvement. And uh, this, these are Redis results uh, uh, where you see uh, a 9% benefit in tail latency and 21% benefit in throughput. So very quickly, these were the results. This is what we got um, and over to Tommy. Thanks, Ali. Um, maybe you could give me a nod if you can hear me, Ali. <laughs> Sweet. Um, all right. I'm going to share my screen here for a second. <clears throat> if it lets me. Ellie, just as you help me um, debug the kernel, you want to help me debug this um, screen sharing setting? Sure. Why don't you? Why don't you? All right, we're in some kind of matrix now. All right, well, um, in the time I'm remaining, I assume someone will start playing some music and kick me off on this thing ends. So uh, I, I thought it would be fun to uh, to kind of do a bit of a demo, the idea being to, uh, to try to make it a little more concrete what some of these shortcuts really are and, um, and how they work. Um, so yeah, I'm Tommy Unger. I've been working with uh, Ali for a bit now. Um, so where did we leave off? I think with Ali, we were talking about some of these Redis latency results. You're seeing those, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so let, let's talk through three of these cases, right? So, um, right, uh, once, once we've taken our, our Redis application, right, this thing's completely unmodified, and we link it together with the Linux kernel running on UCAL, Right, we have the opportunity to do some pretty cool optimization. So, the whole UCAL, the scope of the whole UCAL project is huge. Right, you could imagine doing profile guided optimizations, link time optimizations, zero copy I/O on networking paths. But I just want to talk through one option, which is making shortcuts into so directly from your application into kernel paths. Um, and I think the exciting thing there is it kind of opens up the API that. Uh, that that applications actually can can use right. That's normally just the system call interface, but we have the opportunity to really open up the, the entire kernel and turn that thing into just a box of building blocks that that you can make use of. So, looking at a couple of these graphs, right? Start at the top. There's a, a normal Linux system, and what you're looking at is round trip latencies from two bare metal servers, right? There's a benchmark sending requests to the server, the server's sending responses back. And um, what you're looking at is right, just a histogram, the latencies on the X and the counts uh, on those curves, right? And, and a couple picked out, right? 99 tail latency up here. 
So one thing you're seeing, that shortcut that Ali talked about, right? So intersecting the application at the glibc layer and vectoring directly into system calls, right? Skipping a lot of that intermediate code, which is checking things like, you know, we have uh, uh, signals to check, right? We have, um, uh, we have an RCU quiescent point that we can that we can exploit. Um, there's a lot of work going on there. So when we skip over that, this is the this is the graph that we recover. And some of the the interesting points there, right, is we got we cut off 10% on that 99 tail, which which corresponded to a 20% throughput win on that path. Right, and something I played around with a bit was some deeper shortcuts, right? Like now that we have the opportunity to call into arbitrary points on these kernel functions, uh, what if we what if we went in even further and, and we actually got that down to a, you know, a 23% improvement on 99 tail and 33% and throughput increase. But that's probably pretty vague and not, uh, not not something that maybe most people have like an intuitive picture of how that works. So I, I thought I would, you know, in the remaining time here, see if if I could uh, show you some pictures that might make that a little more a little more compelling. So um, here we go. Let's uh, let's see how much trouble guys, we can get into. Guys, we have five minutes left, so just yeah, we do have some questions as well. So. Great, great. I'll I'll give you the I'll give you the one minute version if I can here. So let's um let's start off a Redis server, and um let's fire up a benchmark to to give it some work to do. All right, so we got the thing running now. What I'm gonna do over here because the Redis <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, can you still start? Can you still? Oh, nothing. Um, we're good. Um, yeah, I guess I'd never run a, uh, a high throughput, low latency server while presenting before, and apparently my, my machine can't pull that off. But um, so I, I kicked off that server and um, and I generated this profile. Um, which is just uh, periodically sampling where that computation is and performing a backtrace, right? So what function are you currently running and why are you running it? Um, what I'll show you here is when you process that thing, you can actually generate these flame graphs, which I find really, uh, really useful for understanding what's going on in those processes, right? So. Here's here's the uh, here's the result of profiling that server. Um, down here's some of the Redis code, and then you can see there's a jump into glibc, right? Redis calls glibc, and then there's a transfer into the kernel mode, right? And so when we talk about these shortcuts, right, the ability to jump around the system call entry and exit pass, what we're really talking about is going directly from this write call right directly into cases right the kernel uh system call handler for the right system call right when we talk about these deeper shortcuts there's so much work on every single one of these calls where the the kernel is just taking that opaque file descriptor right to file descriptor seven and it's saying wait i i have to go through the virtual file system layer right oh that thing's a socket what protocol is it using? Is it UDP? No, it's TCP. Okay, so now we're finally at the point where we can start the network protocol that actually sends this thing off. So I'll, I'll cut it off there. Um, but the point here is just by building our application together with the kernel into a single binary, we give ourselves a lot of opportunities for optimization. And one of them is exploiting this much wider API, right? Instead of just system call, uh, interactions, you, you can actually jump into arbitrary kernel paths. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Thomas and Ali. Um, let me read out the questions for the recordings so that you can address them. So we have a questions from Wander Costa. So the first, there are three sets of questions. The first question is, do real-time embedded kernels like 
TN kernel and free RTOS fall into category of unikernels? Um, so I, I, if you may address them. Yeah, um, I don't yeah, really um, know TN kernels, but uh, uh, real-time operating systems do not fall uh, under uh, the category of unikernels because for a unikernel, you have to have a single address space, uh, everything linked together, and uh, kind of a kind of a uh, static linking where you can call any function from anywhere. Uh, but we do what we do have in in the pipeline here at BU uh, and Red Hat is that we, we try we want to try to add whatever uh, different uh, mechanisms uh, real-time operating systems uh, have and the real-time patches of links have and try them on UKL, then now that you have much more flexibility, can you change the scheduler? Can you uh, make other decisions without having, uh, without being restricted by the syscall interface? So uh, I think our real-time operating systems are orthogonal to the unikernel effort, but yes, all of them can, we can, we can combine these efforts. All right. So another question is, what processors, family, or models do you implement the kernel app on? Yeah, so uh, we used, uh, right now, uh, UKL is running on um, x86-64 Intel uh, processors. Uh, we have, again, uh, in pipeline, uh, we have students who want to do an ARM port of this thing, but right now only uh, Intel x86-64. All right. Um, the third and the last one is, how does the performance compare with the approach of splitting the application user and kernel parts, either through the kernel module or an EBPF application? Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the uh, kernel uh, module part uh, where in, in UKL, you do not have to be restricted by the kernel programming model. You can take your application as is, the entire library, everything, not port it to kernel code, and you can run it in the kernel as a unikernel. Uh, I think Tommy will talk about BPF in, in more detail, but BPF has a has a assumption of security that there are multiple uh, different processes running on the kernel in, on the on the machine, and then you have BPF, which is a secure way of doing in kernel computation. With UKL, you do not have that uh, restriction because uh, the idea is that these are single user uh, machines. These are not general purpose machines. So now you do not have to be restricted by what BPF allows you, what BPF's uh, compiler allows you, if the code will go through the static checking or not. Um, you have your entire uh, application, you have your entire kernel, you can access uh, different hard uh, drivers. You can, if you know what you're doing, sky is the limit. Uh, Tommy, you want to add something? Yeah, I think I think it's a in-depth conversation about how these things, uh, how, how these models compare to module um, programming or or BPF. But uh, uh, BPF, I mean, yeah, when you ins if you can in if the code you care about, you you can inject it into the the prolog or epilog of a kernel function. If that's if that's enough to implement what you need. Um, that that's great. Um, I think that UKL allows a lot of uh, cool spaces that, that you just can't do when you aren't jamming those two programming models together, right? Um, and an example there would be running profile guided optimization across your application to kernel paths at the same time. Um, so yeah, they're they're kind of uh, in some ways complementary. In some ways, they're they have slightly different uh, kind of. Uh, research spaces but uh yeah we we love bpf use it all the time for for profiling and prototyping stuff um yeah i think uh one, one interesting thing is you can write code in the application model and then run it in ring zero on ukl right and that's that's something that in the restricted model of module programming you don't really have full access to for example a glibc underneath you um, so if you wanted to put a, 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 a machine learning algorithm on a what used to be a kernel path, right, you, you can use these high level, you know, you can run Python code in the middle of what you'd normally consider a kernel path. So, yeah, I think they're, they're very different projects, but um, I'll, I'll stop there. 
All right. Uh, the Harry just uh, gave us a comment about the person who gave the BPF talk uh, also said it was in uh, was in depth questions, but he would be interested in talking to you about it. Uh, Noah Corley is his name. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ali and Thomas, for this wonderful talk. And we will be moving over to our next event, that is the closing ceremony and trivia.